Thanks for coming, everyone. We might just uh, make a start. So my name is uh, Andrew John. I'm a PhD candidate um, here at the, the Climate College and, and a colleague of, of CINAS in infrastructure engineering as well. So we're both hydrologists and I can see we've got a couple of hydrologists in the room, which is always a good time. Um, I just want to give a quick introduction to, to Sina and his talk today. So Sina, um, as I said, colleague of mine, uh, graduated with a, a Master of Science from Lund University in, in Sweden. And he's in the sort of latest stages, I believe, of his PhD. Um, right now. thesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right at the pointy end. Um, and Sina's topic is mostly focused on improving um, uncertainty in hydrological modeling um, with some really interesting work on concepts of equifinality. Um, but today he's going to be talking about uh, climatic changes or regional human activities, explaining the environmental tragedy of um, Lake Urima desiccation, um, which I think is, you know, some of your master's work as well. Yeah. Yes. So without further ado, um, I'll get off stage and welcome Sina. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to talk about this work that we did on uh, Lake Urumia. Uh, drawing, which is mainly um, a political and environmental science sort of, kind of debate and uh, research. And um, I'd like to acknowledge all the co-authors that are part of the paper that is the basis of this talk. It was published earlier this year in the Journal of Hydrology. All details of the analysis are there. If you'd like, you can check. And um, a little bit about the lake. It's on the northwest of Iran, close to the border that Iran is sharing with Turkey. And it's a pretty mountainous area. And um, the, the aquatic ecosystem of the lake is pretty unique. That's why it was designated on the, under UNESCO Biosphere uh, Reserve in 1976. It's a Hypersaline lake, meaning that the salinity of the lake is above 160 gram per liter. It's more than the uh, salinity of oceans. So it's a very unique system in that sense because the, uh, the ecosystem of such saline systems are very different from the freshwater systems or the um, um, coastal systems. And um, the lake itself spans about 145 uh, kilometers on the length and about 58 on the width. And uh, the, the lake is a shallow terminal lake, meaning that all the inflowing rivers inside this basin are actually inflowing to this lake, terminal lake. And it is shallow, meaning that the, the average depth of the lake is about four and a half uh, meters, it, um, sorry, five and, a half, five, five and a half meters, but it also varies significantly along the lake. And because it's a shallow lake, the relationship between the area and the volume of the lake is very sensitive to the water level of the lake. And I will talk a little bit more about that and the implications of that sensitivity in terms of the um, environmental um, implications of that. So if you look at the, the, the depth of the lake, uh, what is called the bathymetry of the lake, you can see that the deepest uh, parts of the lake are up here, and around here you would have the, the most shallow parts of the lake. And since it's a saline system and a terminal system, all the uh, nutritions and the salts and the sediments are coming from all over the basin to this lake and sedimenting on that. And therefore, there's a significant change in the, um, in the level uh, or the depth of the lake. So for instance, during two and a half-ish uh, years, based on, one, oops, based on one study, about 64 centimeters salt was deposited on the lake. So it's a significant change in terms of the lake bathymetry, and that would change Sorry about that. That would change significantly the volume and the area of the lake and so on and so forth. So about eight meters dropped um, on the lake level since the beginning of the past century. That would mean that the, uh, the lake volume and area significantly changed. About more than 80% of the lake volume was decreased and about uh, more than, um, I guess, 88% of the lake area, surface area, uh, was decreased, so it's a significant change in terms of the, um, the area of the lake, and therefore you would end up with a significant uh, uh, catastrophic actually change 
on the entire system that lake is at the heart of it. For instance, a massive amount of salt crystals are um, forming around the lake and um, uh, the red color on the lake is actually a phenomenon called red tide. Algal blooms are happening all, all over the lake, so it's a significant eco um, hydrological um, phenomenon happening. It's a negative one because uh, the 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 only uh, uh, organism living in the lake, the um, um, Artemia ormiana, is actually not capable of handling that amount of salt anymore. So that fragile ecosystem is actually collapsing because of that significant drop of the lake level. And this is not an isolated incident. If you look at uh, look around the world, you would see that massive amount of uh, a large number of uh, lakes around the world are significantly decreasing. Um, if you like to go to Latin America, um, Africa, Central Asia, or what may have you, you would observe the same phenomenon. And that phenomenon is actually uh, begging a question: What is driving? such sort of significant decrease in, uh, in the lakes. So there are two sides to this debate. The climatic changes are driving the, uh, the, the drying or regional human activities. And that question has not only scientific implications because it's a scientific question, but it's also a public debate because it has implications in terms of the policy and how we want to manage the, the natural resources in that region. And therefore, it's a very important and timely question to ask. So on the climatic side of the debate, it is argued that the droughts are becoming more frequent and more prolonged because we have less precipitation now, for instance, or the uh, temperature has, uh, has rised and uh, evapotranspiration has increased. For instance, if you look globally, you can see that from the last quarter of the past century, the temperature has significantly increased all over the, uh, the globe. And if you look at the case of Iran, you can see that the same pattern exists. So the temperature has increased significantly and therefore uh, more evapotranspiration and therefore the drying of the lake, that side of the debate. But we cannot ignore the regional human activities. Population growth um, basically implies that we need to secure more food, energy, and water supply. And that is the, the main reason that we're... Um, expanding our water resources projects in terms of damming the rivers and uh, uh, diver uh, diversion projects, for instance, inflowing, lakes, uh, inflowing rivers to the lakes are now uh, massively dammed by the regional uh, farmers' communities to, to in, in order to secure water for their agricultural activities. And also the groundwater, the groundwater overexploitation is a serious problem because that's like uh, um, like your uh, long-term saving in terms of the economy of environment. And now we're using the long-term saving. And uh, this would cause um, an enormous amount of problem in terms of um, uh, land slides and land degradation, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this problem of um, water resources management or natural resources management uh, has, uh, has been a focus of uh, many um, environmental scientists, especially from the economic side of things. And that's why this phenomenon of when your demand, demand of water is more than the supply of the water, is called water bankruptcy. Your demand is more than the amount of you have. Or it's called also anthropogenic drought or socioeconomic drought, as opposed to other types of drought, which are like atmospheric drought, hydrological drought, ecological drought. And this is the core of this side of the debate that we will argue for, that the main changes in the Lake Urmia as one instance of the global phenomena of drying lakes are mainly driven by the regional human activities, namely anthropogenic drought or water bankruptcy. In the case of this lake, if you go back in 2011, you would see that more than 300, uh, sorry, 230 uh, water resources projects were um, approved by the um, authorities. And th these are dams or agricultural uh, water diversion projects and all over the, the basin. And also there was a causeway built on the dam that is, uh, that, that caused a lot of concern from uh, the local communities, especially environmentalists, that it is changing the circulation pattern of the lake. So 
what I'm trying to say here is that there has been massive changes in terms of the dynamic of the lake because of human interaction with the lake. The inflowing uh, rivers to the lake has decreased significantly. You can see that pretty much from the uh, beginning of the century, it has decreased, although there is significant variability from one year to another year. But as you come towards uh, the past decade, you can see that the decrease of the inflow to the lake is considerable. I would like to acknowledge that uh, since 2013, uh, under the Rouhani's government, uh, a national committee was formed, uh, Ormia Lake Restoration Program. They're collecting all the data, integrating the data, but also trying to monitor the lake. And their main goal is to restore the lake by international collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. And parts of the data that I used with the colleagues for this work were actually um, given by the, the Ormia Lake Restoration Program. To what extent that can pan out to restore the lake? Is a separate question, I'm not gonna delve into that, but there are some uh, serious efforts being made by that committee now. So the hypothesis or the main question is whether it's climatic or human driven. And if you look at here, you would see that, sorry, I'm not very technologically advanced. So if you look at here, the atmospheric drought um, in terms of the precipitation um, is a serious challenge. The precipitation has decreased in the past uh, decade, and there are spells that the, um, the um, atmospheric drought is significant. The lake water level has decreased significantly since the beginning of the century, and the water usage or the water withdrawal has increased. And you can see that the runoff to the lake it's, which is quite variable, has decreased significantly. So these are some physical evidence for either side of the debate to, to, to ask that question. But also, and excuse me for that uh, terrible data visualization from my master thesis, I was trying to show in some horrible way that the amount of, uh, the, the expansion of the amount of uh, water resources projects under dam since the, and the, the beginning of the century has increased, and uh, uh, I don't think it's a very good data visualization. <laughs> anyway, the other factor here is the groundwater exploitation that I talked about. So there are a significant amount of wells all over the, the basin. Many of them are legal wells, but even though there are legal wells, the number is massive and it's increasing on a crazy rate. If you look here from the beginning of the century, it is pretty much doubled up the number of the, the groundwater wells. And a big part of that are actually deep groundwater uh, wells. So we're actually exploiting um, a resource that cannot be restored or um, um, even uh, managed in any way uh, very easily and on a short term uh, timeline. And the volume, in terms of the volume, you can see that the volume has pretty much uh, doubled or even more than doubled over here uh, if you compare it with the historical uh, rate of the groundwater usage. So all this physical evidence or um, information about the, the lake system actually led us to form the, the main scientific hypothesis that can we define two different periods of pre-change and post-change compare them and to see if the changes are due to human activities. So we did the petty, uh, the petty uh, um, statistical test. We identified the beginning of the century as the landmark of that um, distinction between the pre-change and the post-change period. And um, all the analyses that we did are based upon this um, statistical distinction, which was informed by all the physical evidence of the lake. So it's not purely statistical. Um, understanding of the system, but the statistics are built upon the physical understanding of the system. So um, uh, in terms of um, the, the dynamics of the system, we have hydrological changes, we have atmospheric changes, and then we have land use changes. And for each of them, we, uh, we actually uh, pro uh, prepared a number of data sets. I'm not going to go through the details of the data set preparation, but I will give you the overview of the data that we used. For the um, hydrological one, we looked at the water level of the lake, 
two different sources. We chose the, um, the ground observation uh, from a station on the lake. Um, we have soil moisture data from remotely, uh, from remote sensing sources. Then we have precipitation from three different sources. We compared them using some statistical methods of um, accounting for the errors in the data, and we chose the GPCP data set for precipitation. And also we have the temperature data. All of these data sets for the atmospheric side of things are actually based on remote sensing data. And then for the land use changes, we actually looked at the vegetation coverage and the changes of that. For that, we used the NDVI data set, which is based on, again, remote sensing data. And the point here is the vegetation coverage is mainly agricultural areas. Therefore, it can be a proxy for the amount of water that was used in the, in the area and also account for the amount of evapotranspiration due to that. And um, the analyses, uh, or what we call the change attribution analysis that we developed the method for this study, is uh, based upon this objective of we observed some changes in the system, we want to explain the change. That observation is based on physical understanding. Again, not everything is based on the statistics, but a statistics is a tool to explain what we understand and, uh, um, and uh, observe in the physical world. The approach is within the statistical paradigm of uh, frequentist um, statistics or the classic um, approach to statistics. So it has its own assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. And the procedure is if we can identify some changes for that, we use the non-parametric uh, method of uh, Mankindle trend analyses. We identify some changes and then we try to form some, some hypotheses to at least tentatively explain what are the, the reasons for those changes and then go and uh, try to evaluate those hypotheses. And for that, we use the, uh, the correlation analysis to, to see if we can associate different or find different relationships between them. Um, I acknowledge that correlation does not imply causation and vice versa, but correlation is a tool to inform our understanding about the possible a possible um, statistical relationship between variables. And um, eventually, all the tentative explanations should be confirmed against further evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And there are qualitative information about the lake and uh, the changes in the lake that we can uh, further evaluate or confirm that, that explanation that we provided uh, as a result of this study. The caveat is, of all the variables and the data sets that I told you about, only vegetation coverage is a um, 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 spatial variable. All the other uh, variables were actually um, summarized in terms of a representative time series for the entire basin. So we're actually making a big assumption over there. It's a caveat. Um, should always acknowledge those uncertainties. But the, the point is, we just want to have um, a sort of an overview or big picture analysis of the dynamic but we put the main focus of our analysis on the um, temporal variability. So if you remember, I said pre-2000 was the pre-change and post-2000 was the post-change periods. We can look at the long term for the entire record or the short term, either pre-change or the post-change periods. Or we could also look at the overall uh, time series in terms of all the monsters together, or we can look at the seasonal changes because this system has enormous seasonality because, for instance, agriculture has its own season, um, rainfall has its own season, increase of temperature in the summer, and therefore more evaporation has its season. So there is seasonality in this system. If you look at the, the, the trend analyses of each of these variables, long-term and short-term, uh, you can see that the precipitation does not show a significant change comparing the, the two periods. And temperature has increased a little bit. And uh, soil moisture has decreased a little bit. Well, vegetation coverage has increased. And water level has decreased significantly. So the reason that I put this very um, big picture um, sort of like uh, crude analysis of the trend is just to show how significant the change in the water level is compared to all the other variables. Um, the, um, the core of the analysis that we did is actually this uh, correlation matrix. 
everything is here. Uh, I will point out the, the most important and the most uh, interesting parts of this. Uh, the correlation matrix is based on the Spearman rank correlation, which basically means that we looked at the, the, the rank of the data as opposed to the data itself to find any monotonic relationship between the variables, whether linear or nonlinear. And then we looked at the monthly scale, not the daily scale. And uh, we also accounted for the lags between different variables. And also we, 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 we use the p-value as the measure of a statistical significance. The first relationship is, is between the precipitation and water level. If you compare the pre-change and the post-change period, you would see that in the pre-change period, it's a significant um, relationship, statistically speaking. And uh, the strength of that relationship is about 0.25 of correlation. That relationship is no more significant in the post-change period, and therefore uh, tendency for the climat atmospheric climatic changes uh, on the other side of the debate. The temperature is a still a significant relationship, but it is decreased from the pre-change to the uh, uh, post-change period in terms of the strength. So, the, the influence of the temperature on the water level uh, dynamics of the lake was stronger in the past century compared to this century. And the most interesting relationship is the vegetation coverage relationship. In the pre-change period, it is positive. In the post-change period, it's negative. So the relationship is reversed. It means basically that in the past century, whenever the water level was decreasing, the vegetation coverage was decreasing. And whenever the water level was increasing, the vegetation coverage was also uh, increasing. So there was sort of a, like a har harmony between those two variables. But now, in the post-change period, the lag is different, but also the relationship is reversed. The, the vegetation coverage is increasing, but the water level is decreasing. And that reverse is actually uh, the most indicative uh, statistical evidence for our argument that the human activities in terms of agricultural expansion is driving the change. Um, if you look at the, the spatial uh, and decisional um, variability of the vegetation coverage, you would see that uh, significant variability exists in this variable if you go from one year to another year or if you go from one month to another month. So you have both intraannual and interannual variability. And uh, to, to make the analysis more uh, manageable, we chose May and July as two representative months to do the analysis. May is actually a wet month, and July is a dry month, and both of them are within the, the um, irrigation season. So if you compare the, the amount of vegetation coverage in the month May from one year to another, so compare the amount of vegetation coverage in the month May this year compared to the last year, same month, you would see that the vegetation coverage has increased significantly from one year to another. But also during the irrigation season from March to July, you can see that the vegetation coverage has significantly and consistently increased. So this graph is based on a baseline year, year 2000. And what we're trying to quantify here is the amount of change in each year compared to the year 2000. So as you can see, except for 2008, every year over the past decade, consistently and significantly, the vegetation coverage was increased over the, the irrigation month. Made a beautiful GIF to make up for my terrible um, data visualization from my master thesis to showing that if you look at the past century, the, ch the rate of change in precipitation and vegetation is, is increasing. All the precipitation data is above the, the horizontal line, meaning that there is an increase in the precipitation. Almost in all cases, there is an increase in the vegetation but the water level is consistently decreasing over the past decade. Well, when we published this data, this, this study, it received significant uh, attention from the social media. I'm just putting this slide here to show off that people like, liked our study. Um, um, I'm actually kidding. The, the point here is within the hydrological community, 
there has been an initiative to define the 23 unsolved problem of hydrology. This um, community initiative is now published as a paper. I was delighted to be a part of it. And one of the main themes of the, um, the community, the hydrological sciences community, was to look at the interface of hydrology and society, to see how we can resolve or solve or address or to some extent understand the problems in the society. That, um, that significant number of retweets and likes and the comments from the local communities back in Ormia shows that there is value in moving hydrological sciences more towards society or as they call it, water for society. We have massive changes in the climate and the hydrology. They're leading to significant social problems and there's a, a demand from the society to, to understand and learn and, uh, and, and to know more about this problem. And part of the problem is because people are not fully aware of the system. For instance, the water consumption rate in Iran is more than the global average. It is a problem, and that's why the demand side of your um, uh, water uh, bankruptcy is getting higher. And therefore, if you want to change the problem, if you want to solve the problem, you need to inform the, the, the communities in order to decrease their demand. This is actually what happened during the millennium drought in, in Melbourne, that they put all the investors, or the majority of their, um, the, the bigger part of the solution on managing the demand side of it, rather than putting more structures and more structural solutions. And the decrease in the demand, uh, the water demand in Melbourne, it's actually, a, I think, a badge of honor that any Melbourneian should put on their chest because it significantly decreased and it solved the problem. And this is what we're arguing for, that climatic changes are not driving the problem in Ormia. This is not the main reason because it's very easy then to absolve yourself as a politician or a policymaker from the responsibility. You can say, it's climate change. We can't do anything about it. But the, the problem is actually a man-made problem in the sense, or a human-made problem in the sense that regional human activities are driving the problem. And we can actually attack and address those changes on a more short-term basis and in a more manageable way. And even the scientific community now understands and acknowledges that the essence of uh, perhaps uh, at least one essence of the, the, the science of water or the science of hydrology. Um, to conclude, uh, we compare two different hypotheses, climatic changes, mainly atmospheric climatic changes versus human activities to, to see which one is driving the change. We cannot say that the change in the lake, significant decrease in the water level area and volume in the lake is, uh, could be explained uh, by, by atmospheric changes. However, uh, regional human activities can be identified as the primary driver of the lake because you can explain the change in the lake by understanding the relationship between the water level decrease in the lake since the beginning of the century against the massive increase of the vegetation coverage. That land use change basically means that the amount of irrigation, the amount of water you put into the system to irrigate the system has increased, therefore vegetation has increased, agricultural vegetation, and therefore the amount of transpiration from that has increased, therefore you're losing more water from the vegetations because of that. And also all the water that you lost from the vegetation is also coming from all the water that was initially or originally inflowing to the lake. So you're losing water from that inflowing rivers to the lake as well. And therefore, the lake has decreased significantly. You should also acknowledge that the, ground, the role of the groundwater in this system is not known well. It's, um, it's called uh, epistemic uncertainty or knowledge uncertainty. Basically means all the uncertainties because of the things we don't know yet or we may not be able to know at all. We know that the, the, the extraction has increased significantly. But to what extent the, the lake uh, water level is dependent on the groundwater level is not fully known, it's not well known. Uh, there are not good studies about that and the data is pretty scarce and uh, of, uh, of um, rather low quality. So we should acknowledge that this relationship is not well known and uh, uh, we need to do more work on that if we want to go towards um, uh, a restoration program for the lake. Um, I should say uh, that, okay, do you want to? We can go back to your, your last slide and we can do that at the end.
Okay. Um, I guess on that note, I should say that I'm looking for postdoc opportunities from the end of the year. So if you know anybody, let me know. And uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Climate uh, College, for hosting me. If you're interested, uh, you can read uh, the rest on the paper. Or if you have any questions, suggestions, and hopefully some brutal criticisms, please reach out. Thank you all. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for that, Sina. Um, yeah, I think that, that point you made that um, sort of science and, and hydrology can really form a critical part of actually informing public debate in, in some of these environmental tragedies rather than just letting things play out in the media by themselves. It's not always the most useful no. thing. So, yeah, I'm glad to hear that example. Um, you know, it's something that we've all seen in sort of the Murray-Darling Basin back home. Um, yeah. Uh, is there any questions for, for Sina? Yeah, so sorry, I'll just say if you have a question, just wait for the mic so um, we can record the, the seminar. But cheers. Yeah, no, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, so I was just curious to ask about sort of towards the end, you mentioned how, like, you know, in Melbourne, we dealt with drought by reducing usage. Um, I think Melbourne did that sort of through domestic reduction, you know, not watering your lawn and not going crazy. But it sounds like this is a very agricultural region. So how do you have suggestions of what can be done in regions like this that are losing water from agricultural use? Like what can be done to sort of, you know, change that? Um, it's a valid question. And I think the easiest way, uh, in turn, at least theoretically, is to look at the crop pattern. What sort of crops are we irrigating in that region? And can we have more, um, more appropriate crops in that region that are not using as much water as the current crop pattern is using. And that is part of the solution. It has been a part of the scientific debate, but the challenge here is to what extent you can actually convince the local communities and the farmers to go back and change their entire crop pattern because they put investment in it, there's some sentimental value or family values into it. But um, the biggest part of the solution would be to change that crop pattern. Thank you. That was really interesting. You mentioned earlier that the, the lake is remarkably saline. How do they use that salty water for irrigation of crops? So the, the inflowing rivers are not as saline as the, the lake itself. So they just use the water from the inflowing rivers to the lake before it gets to the lake. When one sits get to the lake, part of it from the agricultural lands, it brings a lot of sediment to the lake. But um, if in um, like um, local regions they have some sort of water um, like um, cleaning or um, sort of treatment, I'm not aware of. But the biggest amount of sediment are actually getting to the to the lake uh, towards the end of the the river um, um, system, not from necessarily the beginning parts that they're actually using that water for the agriculture. Thanks, Sina. Um, sorry if I missed this, but I saw you had your time series of the precipitation and the stream flow coming in. Did you also have measurements or estimations of the evaporation off the lake during that time? No. So we didn't have a reliable data on the evaporation from the lake itself. And we decided not to look into that because apparently it's a very complex system because as the rate of salinity changes, the rate of evaporation would change non-linearly because up to a point, as you have more temperature, the evaporation would increase. But from a certain point, uh, because of the salinity, the, the bonds between the water molecules and the, the sediments are so strong that you cannot extract water as easily anymore, even though there's temperature. And also, I don't understand this fully well, but apparently when sediments are actually precipitate, precipitating on the bed of the lake, it actually can give rise to some sort of uh, temperature rise due to some um, chemical phenomenon happening. I don't understand that fully well, but we, we realize that it's a very complex thing. So we just decided to uh, put that aside and assume that the amount of water transpiring and evapotranspirating from the agricultural area would be a reasonable proxy to, to, to account for the, the change. Uh, I've got one. Yeah, can I go first? Then you. 
um, it's it's interesting that because you know because the that inundation area of the lake has decreased so dramatically over time. Um, it sounds like the government, uh, the local government, or the state government in the area had um, were encouraging investment in, in agricultural development. But surely there's been some kind of trade off in in regional communities or, or industries that were actually based on the lake that are now you know are there towns there that are, un that are uninhabitable or like are there you know are there industries that have gone actually out of action mm. as a result of that investment decision elsewhere that's a good question and the honest answer is i don't know i don't have good good enough knowledge of all the local communities to answer that question but there are two major cities on both sides of the lake the ormia and the tabri city and they are people over there and the population is increasing to what extent in future the drying of the lake would impact them i don't know for instance, there are some discussions about, given that the, the lake uh, has dried, now there are a lot of salts and sediments on the, on, on the lake bed, and that can give rise to dust storms. And there are evidence showing that dust storms has increased in those two cities. So it may actually change the nature of the industry and the, the local communities in those cities. But um, uh, in terms of um, local industries, I don't know. I don't know, and I don't know to what extent actually the local community is benefiting from all the sediments because as far as I understand, there are some very uh, valuable um, um, sediments and uh, minerals on the lake bed, but to what extent they're extracted and used, um, I don't know. Hi, thanks, Sena. Um, you mentioned that in 2013, uh, organization was set up to help look at managing the lake. Um, I just wonder, is, is this organisation, are they looking at practices or looking at changing agricultural practice? Is that one of their priorities? Like you, in answering the previous question, suggested is something that could help the difference? I know they're talking about the this, this bit, but if it's a priority of their restoration program, I don't know. To be honest, I didn't follow the progress of that committee. They publish reports regularly and uh, the, they have set some baseline for improving the lake water level and in terms of both the water level of the lake and also the ecological level of the lake. To what extent they account for the crop pattern, I don't know. But when I had a debate, uh, like more of a conversation, not a debate, with uh, a number of the uh, members of that um, program, when they came here about March 2017, it was one of the concerns. And actually one of the, 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 the union representatives of the farmer community was here. And I realized that there is a significant um, reluctance towards changing the crop pattern. So that was the issue over there. But to what extent they could actually convince them and build trust in order to convince them since then, I don't know. Sina, thank you very much for the presentation, very interesting. Um, from the data that you presented, I assume that the system was not regulated at all before 2000, and then after those projects, now you have a very regulated system. I don't know if you have access to storage data, the amount of storage that was created by the dams, but do you consider that if you can address the usage data in the agriculture, you, can, you could actually increase the resilience of the system to climate change using correctly the storage in the system? Yeah, yeah. So in my terrible data visualizations, <laughs> I only put the, the major dam projects. So there, there were some regulations before, 20, uh, before 2000, but they are pretty small, relatively speaking, compared to the ones after 2000. And it has a lot to do with the population increase, but also you need to account for the fact that since the revolution in 1979, Iran was under sanction. So food security was one of the national priorities. So that's the rationale behind that, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the other factor about um, resilience, um, it is true. And one of the papers that I cited here by um, some of the colleagues, is actually arguing for that, that if you want to restore the lake, we have to have a climate informed sort of restoration system to, to be able to account for that variability and resilience due to climate. Um, how to do it, uh, it's a big question. What I can say is 
one of the one of the major gaps in the current literature and discussion is that when they when they look at those questions, they most look at from the hydrological side, like how much water should we put in the lake and in what season. Um, but that's not sufficient because you also need to account for all the wetlands around the lake. Uh, what is your objective? Do you, do you just want to increase the lake water level, or there are some like features or like um, organisms in the system that you want to restore them? And that is part of the problem that the ecological side of this debate does not have enough information and um, data about the, the changes, or if they have that data, they're not at the table to argue for that because it's a very complex system. So the majority of that discussion about the resilience is hydrological, and it is good that it's part of the debate, but it's not sufficient. Uh, any any last questions or no? Okay, well, um, just join me once more in, in thanking Sia. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. And so I'll just do a quick plug for some of the upcoming uh, seminars um, at the college. So on uh, Monday, the 1st of July, we've got um, Kira Rundle, uh, Organic Solar Cells, Challenges and Opportunities for Enhanced Uptake. Um, and the week after that, on Wednesday, the 10th of July, we've got uh, manage data with uh, smart grid and renewable energy integration challenges, mitigation, mitigation strategies, um, and associated grid codes. So that last one's at the college, but the first one is at the Fritz Lowe Theatre at University. So thanks a lot. And um, yeah, see you next time.